This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast for the Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here. Wildlife Control Consultant bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife podcast as part of the Pest Geek podcast family. Really glad to have you on board. Want to give you an opportunity here to subscribe to our channel. We also want you to be sure to get every episode. And we've been really gratified by the amount of downloads that you all have been using and uh, the occasional feedback we get. I would love to get a lot more, but we're certainly gratified by the downloads. How do you get a hold of me? Wildlife Control Consultant at gmail.com. Wildlife Control Consultant at gmail.com. If you can't find that, look me up online at Wildlife Control Consultant.com. Again, there's no S on the end of that consultant. So, what are we going to talk about today? I've been thought of today I'd wanted to talk about the animal rights movement and the legislation that they're they continuously bring against elements of our industry. And so I wanted to talk about what I think is really a gap within our industry, and that is its emphasis on trying to enact positive regulatory or legislative change. And I know this is a difficult topic for many of you because, uh, you know, a lot of wildlife control operators really don't like politics. And it is an ugly business. It is a dirty business. Uh, it needs requires patience. It's not something where you can just snap your fingers and get something done. Uh, it is difficult and it takes a long-term perspective. And, you know, you guys are busy and you're trying to make money and you're like, why can't people just leave me alone? And frankly, the reason is, is because there are people who get up every day dedicated to not leave you alone. And you're just going to have to deal with that. I mean, I hate to break it to you, but that's just the reality of it. So let's get started on what, why this is such an important issue. Well, a couple of things. New Mexico, uh, Bill, look at my notes here, SB32 is attempting to ban trapping on public land. And you say... I'm a wildlife control operator, why should I care? Folks, this is what the animal rights protest industry relies on. They want to keep carving out this issue, that issue, to just keep slicing away at the salami until there's nothing left. And that's how they work it, because this is what they did to us in Massachusetts with the uh, Ban Cruel Traps campaign, which was the Animal Protection Act, Wildlife Protection Act, they attacked all the traps except the ones that the that the pest control industry used. They knew full well they didn't have the ability to take on the pest control industry. So voila, mouse traps and rat traps magically became exempt from this particular legislation. What a shock, right? Because they knew that the power of the pest control industry would have slapped down this le- this ballot initiative. It wasn't legislation; it was a ballot initiative. Never underestimate. The power of stupid people voting. I'm going to lay it out to you for you. You have got to figure, you've got to get into the fight here. So here we have some legislation about public lands. You can say, I don't care about public lands. Well, you should care about public lands because what this basically is, is a law that allows people to let their pets roam free on public land because they don't want to worry about your trap. It's really that simple. For some reason, we have raised a generation who thinks that public land is just a place where they don't have to leash their pet. And therefore, they can let their pet roam free and kill all the wildlife and haze the wildlife and and flush wildlife. And oh, isn't that cute? Because I'm out here thinking that public lands are just a place for me to exercise. And it really boils down to that. Unfortunately, the people in the fur industry and in the wildlife control operator industry don't make it quite that simple because it's how you frame the debate that matters. And I'm telling you that a lot of this stuff by the animal protectionists, they are exploiting people that just think that their dogs are a part of their family. And in many families, unfortunately, their dog is as valuable as their children and treat their, they're called fur children. 
uh, which is truly scary. There is a, there is a cultural change occurring in our country where dogs used to be a working animal. Now it's a family member. It's not even a pet anymore. It's now a family member. And so people think that their dog has the right to roam free in public land and therefore they don't want to have to deal with traps. It's not about animal welfare. That's basically what gets the news. It's fundamentally about people don't want their dogs getting trapped. That's my opinion, of course. So uh, you can choose to disagree with it or not. The problem is, is as they keep slicing away issues. So if you have someone on public land who abuts public land and they're having some wildlife issues and you would be easier for you to trap off of on that public land rather than on their property, you're out of luck. So don't just think it's easy to say, well, it's just the fur trappers, I shouldn't care. You should care because once they're done with those folks, you're, you may be next, if not the bow hunters next. So this is what they're relying on because the key is to bring a lot of force to a minority population, and we are a minority population as wildlife control operators, and fur trappers are even a greater minority population than that. Uh, I thought, statistic that said there were probably 10,000 fur trappers in the country and I believe there's only two or three thousand that are members of national associations the NTA uh, I don't know what's in membership is for the fur takers so but that's not what I'm talking about today I'm just saying as you as a wildlife control operator need to understand the nature of this fight you have got to understand this is important another piece of uh, this was petition done by the HSUS, that's the Humane Society of the United States out of Washington, D.C. They have petitioned the wildlife commissioners in the state of Colorado to ban the use of cage traps for, I would assume, fur, bear, fur trapping. Don't think it have impacted wildlife control. But remember, wildlife control during the season is fur trapping for many people, right? Because they want to harvest the fur and they'll be able to charge a fee as well. And some people actually push off wildlife damage control simply to allow them to harvest the fur. fur. So while I understand that wildlife control is different than fur trapping, we are half brothers, half sisters, however you want to define that. I, don't, I, think, we're close, I think we're closer than cousins. And we need to be careful that we're not throwing our half-brothers under the bus. And the fact of the matter is, too many wildlife control operators don't get aroused until they have a problem. And I'm trying to switch that. If you're familiar with in football, what's called the umbrella defense, where you are always just playing defense because you don't want to give up the big gain, you know that many times those football teams lose. And that's basically what we've been doing as an industry is that we just hope people will leave us alone and we complain that our state agency doesn't take us seriously, and, but we're not putting the effort in to get change enacted. Folks, it's not about the science. Okay, I know that there are certain political parties in our country today who keep trying to parrot, follow the science. Let me, let me break it down to you. No one follows the science unless they agree with the science. So you only use the science when it agrees with you. When you don't like the answer to science, you, are, you argue something else. It's sort of like the old canard with lawyers. If you have the law, argue the law. If you don't have the law, pound the table. That's basically what people do. It's not about the facts. This has never been about the facts. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't argue facts. I'm just simply saying that we have not, our message is not getting out because we're not pushing it. We just think that the state agencies are somehow going to do this for us. They won't. Because in my opinion, they really don't care. They're interested in deer hunters and trying to keep deer hunting going because that's what's funding their agency. They, in my opinion, they don't like us. Oh, they may be glad we're there to stop the phone calls from going to them or out to, what do I do with the raccoon in the chimney? They're glad that that's, but they really don't like us because we're market hunters and that violates the North American uh, wildlife management model. 
right? Because we are being paid to harvest animals. You say, well, what about fur trapping? Fur trapping, you don't notice that they never talk about it much. Partly because we're a minority, but the other reason is they really don't like us. So uh, we can argue about that. You may have exceptions, and I'm not saying everyone in your ag state agency doesn't like you, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's cognitive. But I remember when I was sitting with Tim Julian one time, and we were dealing with, uh, we were talking with a state agent, uh, actually middle management in a very large state in our in our country that had a lot of sportsmen in it. And uh, we were talking about trappers, and the first thing out of his mouth was, well, trappers don't do themselves any favors. And Tim Julian very calmly took that man apart. He got up and walked away. So what happened was, is that here's a guy in middle management who was expressing his disdain for trappers. Now, maybe he's had a lot of bad experiences with trappers. I, I get it. But the reality is that I, and I would can tell you right now that I would suggest that some of the same attitude is towards us as wildlife control officers. We need to change that. I think it's changing. I don't want to be, a, you know, a negative Nelly here all day long. But I'm telling you, this is hard. And this is going to take time. We have a generation of new biologists coming out of college in grad school who have never fished, never hunted, never trapped. And they're going into state agencies and they're going to be the ones who are going to be pushing for various regulatory changes. That's different from just how the society treats trapping. Now you may say, I'm a wildlife control operator, but this is bigger than trapping. You're right. We are bigger than trapping. But trapping is still a major component within the work that we do. We may be using a lot more one-way doors, we may be using a lot more direct control techniques, we may be using a lot more shooting, but trapping is still an integral part of our work, and so we are gonna be involved in this fight. Here we have the, the Humane Society trying to ban cage trapping of fur-bearing animals. Okay? So don't think you're don't think if you just keep giving up ground you're going to be safe. You're not. This is an ideology. That's why I call them the animal rights protest industry. They can't stop protesting because it's what keeps it going. Now that's not talking about the the foot soldier in the field that you're meeting. I'm talking about the aristocracy. This is what I believe about them. That this is an industry. They may they they believe that animals have the right not to be harmed by humans. Period. And the only time that we can harm them is if we're fighting for our life. Now, there's going to be various shades of the rainbow there, but I'm trying to help you understand that this ideology is relentless. It will not stop. So that means you have to be able to stop. You have to be able to stop them. You have to be able to work the politics of it to be sure that you're always fighting back. So if you're always in the defense, we're, we're already lost. And I'm here to make this as a call to wildlife control operators that you have got to consider this issue of how your agenda put them in the defensive and start moving forward with positive legislation. So let me give you some, some strategies by which to do that. So the first strategy is you have to take this as a serious issue for your livelihood. You must consider that part of your job as a wildlife control operator is to market yourself and do some political activity. If you're just all about the money, you are very short-sighted. You are not thinking long-term. Now, maybe you'll retire before the bad stuff happens. Maybe that's the case. That's pretty selfish. What about your children? What about selling your business? Who are you going to sell your business to? What kind of work are you going to do? And for those of you who are in your 20s, what kind of industry are you going to have in 30 years? Are you going to be able to continue to trap? You may say, well, oh, we'll always have the ability to control wildlife. Oh, I'm not saying that. I agree with you. I think that even the animal rights protest industry recognizes there will always be a need for wildlife control. The question is, is will it be private or will it be government? And what sorts of tools will be allowed? Look what happened in California and their loss of second generation anticoagulants. Don't think it can happen to us? 
We're already losing equipment. California eliminated a lot of uh, their fur trapping trade. Why? Because it cost, they argued it was costing them more money to regulate the industry, the wild, the fur, fur trapping licenses than what they got in fees. Can you imagine a state as irresponsibly financially as California? All of a sudden, when it comes to fur trapping, they cared about the finances. That's amazing. Never underestimate the hypocrisy of the public. So you may say we have the so you're, a lot of times we use excuses trying to convince ourselves why we don't need to get into the fight. We have the science on our side. I'm telling you it doesn't matter. We have the facts on our side. I can tell you it doesn't matter. People will hold in our society contradictory truths and think they're completely coherent. That's just the reality. So you have got to get into the fight. Second thing I'm going to suggest that you do is you need to join a national association. It's, it's amazing to me how many people don't join a national association, and you need to do so. Uh, I'm a member of uh, the National Wildlife Control Operators Association. I don't, as you notice, I haven't talked about them much in recent, uh, probably, in, probably in six months or more at this point, but I am a member. Do I think that the association is doing enough on the government lobbying side? The answer is no. I've been petitioning the association for probably since 2000 uh, to do more work in this particular area, and I've, I've clearly failed at this point. Here it is, 2021. Has the association done some things? Yes. Yes, it has. It has contributed monies to various, to fight various ballot initiatives. It has written letters, and uh, don't underestimate the importance of that. You may say, well, it's just a letter. No, it does matter because remember the animal rights protest industry, they just send a letter too oftentimes, but they'll also send people to the location and they're relentless. They're always sending letters. My complaint is that we in our industry, we only send a letter when we're complaining about something. We're trying to block something. We don't send letters that often to propose something. We have got to get off the defense, folks. We have got to stop that. We have got to be pushing for better regulation. We need to be in the face of state agencies. We need to be lobbying our representatives at the state and federal level, telling them we need better attention. We are a valuable industry. We do important work. We help people restore the balance in their lives. We help them get animals out of their house for safety issues. We protect them from disease. We protect property. This is valuable, valuable stuff. A lot of you have been able in during the COVID crisis, you have been considered to be uh, essential workers. Now, we can debate about that whole government classification and that sort of thing. But the point is that at least the government recognized that pest control was important. And we need to stand up for that. We need to get these wildlife agencies to get off their to get off the stick. And you say, now, in fairness to the wildlife agencies, why are they reticent? Because they know as soon as they open the books, it's fair game for whatever the legislature is going to do. That's a fair point. But my response to that is, is it's because we have failed to properly educate and lobby our representatives, so that becomes a scarier issue. But we have got to do something. I would argue that we need to be doing lawsuits. Now, lawsuits are expensive, but I think that there are some places where we could have some targeted lawsuits and we'd likely win. But we don't know until we try. And I'll tell you, when you start win, win, a, win a good lawsuit, people are going to start paying attention when you have that letter come in. So why do you need to join the National Association because numbers matter. Even if you do nothing else, numbers matter. Because when the letter goes in, we can say our blankety blank thousand members is in support of this. That matters to people because politicians like numbers. And the other issue is, is that sometimes a national association is that you're, having, you're paying someone else to do the work for you. It's so what the NRA is, if you're a member of the NRA, if you're put AARP, whatever the organization you're belonging to, that's part of the reason you belong to an association, is that the association takes some of that burden off of your time, because you could hire people who specialize in that. Number three, 
you need to join or create your state association. As good as the national associations are, even under their best days, they can't do everything for the states because, hey, we got 50 states. They're not big enough for that sort of thing. Even the MPMA, which, is, which dwarfs the wildlife control industry, okay? The pest control will always dominate the wildlife control industry because of trophic levels, and I think I've done presentations on that before. But we have got to have state associations that are willing to be feet on the ground who can lobby state agencies. You have to have something local. Politics is local, folks. Can the national help? Absolutely. But there's a limit to what the national can do, in fairness. You have got to see this as an essential part of your business. And it's amazing to me how many state states don't have state wildlife control organizations. And it's because one of the challenges we have in our industry is we have a lot of type A personalities. And frankly, when type A personalities get in the same room, they got to find out who's going to be boss. And when one, and the reason why, I mean, I had one person tell me something which was still fascinating to me. He says, the reason he's self-employed is he doesn't like taking orders. Now, that may or may not be you, but when you're dealing with an association, you've got to work through a process. You've got to learn to dialogue. That's very hard for CEO personalities. They don't like listening to other people. They like ordering other people around. That's just the way it is. So unless we develop, a, we change our personality with one another, we, we're, we're, we're going to get, we're going to get lost because we're going to be too busy fighting each other and getting into, excuse my language, pissing matches and not worrying about the biggest threat and the animal rights people are all unified and they're going to come in and they dominate the field and they're enacting legislation. I had one wildlife, one state agency personnel said he believed that the animal rights people in his state could get whatever they wanted. And the only reason they didn't ask for more is they need to have room for something else to lobby for down the road. Again, that protest industry. And he was dead serious. Guy had a PhD too, okay, if that matters. But he was in the state agency for a long time. Very knowledgeable guy. And that's what he believed. He said, they could have asked for anything they wanted in that ballot initiative. And he believes they could have gotten it. And the only reason they didn't ask for more was that they needed room to ask again in the future. And you got to leave a little bit of room because you got to keep that money coming in, right? You don't want to, you don't want to solve the problem too quickly because then you're out of, then what's the reason for your organization, right? Makes sense. I don't know if he's right or wrong, but it certainly makes sense to me. Number four, you need to watch your language. I've talked about this in the past. You have got to adopt language that does not reinforce an animal rights protest narrative. Are you still using the word live trap? Are you still using leg hold? Are you still using babies? Are you still using humane? Oh, we're humane. Well, what does that mean? Are you using instead the words like cage trap, young, foothold, responsible? We, we control animals responsibly rather than humanely. Do you? And there's a whole lot, there's a lot of other words as well. But are you reinforcing, because when you tell a client you're using a live trap, that means if it doesn't look like that box, everything else is a kill trap. Don't be shocked when you lose that equipment. Are you teaching your clients about the role of lethal traps and how they save the client money? Do you tell them that? Do you have a brochure that explains the rationale for your work and why you recommend certain tools and why it's important that these tools not be banned? You don't? Why? Don't you care about your industry? Fifth, you need to educate your clients. So I've already talked about that. Do you have literature that you're handing out to your clients about the importance of the work that you do and why it's important for them to 
when legislation comes up that they need to be thinking about that don't just simply listen to groups like the HSUS or PETA or some of these other animal rights or animal protectionist groups to say, you know, there's another side of the story. I've, I've learned a new phrase. It's called the seen and the unseen. And that is when we make legislation, we often focus on what is seen with that legislation, but we don't focus on the unintended consequences of that legislation. That's the unseen. People may see, oh, I won't see an animal in a foothold anymore. Well, that may be true. But what are the consequences of that? Maybe greater disease, cost to clients, people losing economic income, greater damage to their property. Loss of income because we're not having fur trappers out doing their role of harvesting using a renewable resource and har harvesting from the environment. There's consequences for every decision and people often don't, we have to tell them what those consequences are. Sixth, you need to lobby the government. You need to lobby the government even when there's nothing on the ballot or nothing in the legislature to harm you. You need to let your government know regularly, that's your state representative, your state so your state uh, wildlife agency, and you know, I would call it your game warden. How, when was the last time you invited your game warden to come out and spend some time with you and learn about your business? I guarantee you they don't know what you do. They don't have a full grasp of what you do or the complexity of what you do. You don't think that's important? You don't think that officer might have some influence? What happens if that officer used to be a field officer, now all of a sudden he becomes the commander of all the enforcement agents? You don't think he has a voice at the table when there's legislation or a policy that's going to be changed? You don't think he has influence? Are you building those bridges now? I can tell you right now the animal rights people are building bridges all the time. They do it often with letter writing campaigns or showing up at various meetings and they are banging a drum, hoping that someday the state agency will listen to them. And if that doesn't work, they'll go the legislative route and force the agency to do it. Or they'll use ballot initiatives and force the agency to do it. Are we doing the same? You say, Stephen, I've got to make a living. I totally get it. I get it. But can you do something? It's your business. It's your future. Are you going to have a future to sell your business to? This is where, this is one of my critiques of the national associations as well as state associations that we need to be more proactive rather than reactive. We have got to be sending newsletters to all these state agency personnel, not to every single individual, obviously, but certainly the fur bearer biologists and any regulatory people. They should be getting a hard copy of news that you want need it in their face. You need to be going, having representatives go to the wildlife board meetings. You need to be lobbying, sending letters to your state legislatures. We need to have enough money to have maybe an advertising campaign. You know, even if we advertise on the web, it's possible now. Animal rights protest industry activists punch above their weight. Do we? I would argue we do not. We would actually, I would argue we punch, we punch below our weight. Why? Because we just are not involved. Because our personality is like, just leave us alone. And as I said before, these people are in the business to not leave you alone. So let me go through that list one more time. Understand this is a fight you need to do as part of your business. I know that's not popular. You're busy enough. You're trying to make a living. I get it. But if you're not getting in the fight, will there be anything left to fight for? You say, well, we'll always have wildlife control. You're exactly right. We all, I believe we always will. But by who? Government worker? Or will you be so restricted as a private worker that you're going to have the, the tools that you've relied upon removed? And by the way, when they remove tools, they never replace them. I used the analogy in the past where I said, you know, if you, we're going to banning, we're going to painting your house is cruel. 
So we're going to eliminate these big broad brushes and we're going to make you paint with something the width of this pencil. We haven't banned painting. We're going to ban the big brushes because the big brushes are cruel. Can you imagine painting your house with something this width? We haven't banned it. You can still paint. But this is what you're restricted. Is that the kind of life you want to have? Now, I'm trying to give you an analogy of what's going to happen when they keep taking tools away from us. I am not married to footholds. I am not even married to cage traps. The point is, is I believe if we can find a better device that's more humane and, and similarly effective, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm okay with that. But that's not what happens. They just simply ban the equipment as if the equipment in and of itself is bad rather than thinking about the combination of the training of the worker and the use of equipment. Every tool has its place. We have got to stop this. We have got to be fighting back and getting some positive regulation for our industry. As I said before, not today, but I've said this before in other podcasts, the government protects what it regulates. Just think of how many people al alcohol kills every year. It's a staggering number. But we haven't banned alcohol. Why? Because the government protects it. They can do the same thing with us to fight back the animal rights protest industry. But we're not fighting back. Because we really don't care. Or, we th or we've given up our hands saying, oh, we can't do anything. Not true. Consider the issue. Join a national association. Join or create a state association. Watch your language. Make sure you're not using language that reinforces an animal rights narrative. And I've given you a few examples of that already. You need to, fifth, you need to educate your clients. You need to have as part of your brochure why your work is important and why you need the tools that you need. By the secrecy in our industry, we're creating problems because what the animal rights people will do is see, ta-da, we have an animal that broke its leg in a, in a foothold. Whoa, there you go. Look at how evil they are because you didn't, you didn't inoculate your client. So it, remember, inoculation mentally is when you explain to your client, yeah, some of, these, some of this equipment hurts. It hurts the animals, sure. But it's the best we got or the most efficient. I tell, tell wildlife control operators, if you have clients who won't allow you to use the most efficient tools, be sure you charge them accordingly. There should be a cost for that. People need that to understand that the animal rights people, they don't, they don't, I would argue, they don't care about the poor. They just, they don't, what do they care about the poor person who's like, well, you could use a con bear, a bunch of con bears to kill these squirrels coming out of holes in their house. There's like, we're going to force you to use cages that may extend the type of work you're doing for several more days and charge that poor person a lot more money. They don't care because for them, it's all about the squirrel. Do we make that case? I hope you do. Lastly, you need to lobby the government. You need to do that personally. Contact your game warden. Your association needs to be writing letters. You can be writing letters. It's email it makes it very easy today. But you need to be letting them know your voice matters. Your industry matters. Your work matters. You need to have you need to set up experts within your industry who can answer responses from the media to push back against these narratives. Do we have those spokespersons? Are we using them? Are we doing a marketing campaign for what we're doing? Why? I hope I've stimulated you a little bit today about the importance that we have got to stop taking it on the chin. We have got to be pushing forward. Tell your associations the importance that this is. It's not just about education and training. Those are important. I think the industry's come a long way in those areas. But some, some of that's to the detriment because they've taken the eye off the ball of the importance of regula regulations and lobbying. All the education in the world doesn't do any good if the equipment that you've been educated on is, gets banned. I hope I've made my case pretty clear today. would love to hear your comments. Let me know how I, how I can help. 
I'm Stephen Van Tassel, Wildlife Control Consultant, giving you another episode of Living the Wildlife. Why? Because we want you to live the wildlife. We don't want you to be the wildlife. Make sure you take some time to subscribe to the Pest Geek Podcast. Let us know what we're doing on Facebook. You can certainly join us there. Send me an email at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Would love to hear your comments, even, yes, even your criticisms. And again, thank you so much for the downloads that you've been giving us. It's been really gratifying. And let us know how we can improve the training we're providing and the information to help you do your job better, make more money, and live a better life. Take care, everybody.